students, welcome back to another lecture in our course Environmental Modeling and Simulation. Today we will continue our exploration of the air pollution model where we are trying to model the plume that, uh, that is related to point source um, which in this case is a chimney, a stack. In the previous lectures we looked at a general equation that includes both diffusion and mass transport or bulk transport together which are known as dispersion. And in today's lecture, we are going to apply boundary conditions so that our general pollution, pollutant transport model becomes specific to the case that we are looking at, which is the point source is the chimney and it's releasing a gaseous pollutant. So let's get started here. So in the previous lecture, what we uh, arrived at was a very general solution And now we are going to apply boundary condition and boundary condition as I discussed in the previous lecture is that uh, the net pollution, the net pollutant emitted by the point source is equal to the total concentration, the total volume, total mass of that same pollutant downwind. Let us spend a couple of minutes looking at that. We have a chimney here and it is releasing some pollutant. That pollutant is being uh, dispersed through both diffusion and the bulk action of the wind. Now as this, this pollutant disperses in the atmosphere, as this pollutant disperses in the atmosphere, we are assuming that the net pollutant that have been em emitted via this single point source is summation of all that exists downwind. From this point 0, x is equal to 0, all the way to x is equal to infinity. For that to happen, there are a couple of conditions which should be met. The first condition is that there should not be any other source of the same pollutant. Now you can see that this will not be the case when we have multiple sources of the pollutant. Let us say the pollutant we are interested in are sulfur oxides, also known as SOX. So this is not just sulfur dioxide, but sulfur oxides. Now if in an, we have an industry that is releasing among many other pollutants sulfur oxide socks in its uh, in its emissions gaseous emissions but there is no other source of socks in the environment at least in the area that we are interested in then this assumption may be true but in case of industrial estates where we have multiple point sources of what may be the same kind of pollutant or the same family of pollutant socks maybe we have a vehicle here Maybe we have other kind of combustions happening, regulated or unregulated combust combustions. In that case, we can assume that the sum total of the contaminant that we are targeting, the pollutant that we are targeting, SOX, downwind from the chimney is equal to the total amount emitted by the chimney. So in this particular case, this assumption will fail. The assumption will also fail if the contaminant that we are talking about starts degrading or transforming into other compounds. For example, let us say we are talking about NOx and then we all know how NOx can contribute to formation of secondary contaminants, secondary pollutant and which will result in smog because of photochemical reactions. There are also other kinds of contaminants, especially organic con contaminants which may be released by an industrial chimney, industrial stack which may degrade over time. So they might undergo a first order decay or a second order decay in the environment. So in that case also the assumption will fail because the concentration that we will sum up downwind will be less than the concentration released by the chimney. Now um, these are the two primary assumptions that um, are required for us to assume the boundary condition but this, are this is very important especially nowadays when we are looking at contaminants which degrade or transform into even more dangerous pollutants and when we have cluster of industries with multiple stacks releasing pollutants. However, this model was developed at the very beginning of industrial revolution when we had couple of industries in a particular area, no more than that and we were dealing with one or maximum of few more chimneys or stacks in a particular industrial estate. So this may not, this model is definitely a gross oversimplification. However, let us say our, more, our contaminant that we are tracking 
does not meet the assumptions that we are making here for boundary condition. Let's say our contaminant is degrading by a first order, uh, first order decay rate and let's say lambda is a decay constant. What we can do is we don't have to throw away this model. We can include this decay in our boundary condition. We can include this decay even uh, when we are coming, even before we arrive at this place where we get a model. Okay. Now let's return back to the ideal condition. The ideal condition being that uh, the net emissions, the net emissions at the chimney over a given time period is equal to sum total of all, so C is the concentration in the environment, okay? Sum total of all the contaminants in the environment downwind. Now this is also important. Uh, there's another assumption that I missed it. Since we're talking about the mass of contaminants downwind of the chimney downwind of the stack, which is the point source, we are also assuming that dispersion is the only way through which the contaminant is being transported, which may not be true for all kinds of contaminants. There might be other ways in which the contaminants get transported once they have been released and they have started uh, dispersing via bulk action of wind and by via diffusion. Also, all the assumptions that we made when we were coming up to this point in our model are also required to be valid uh, when we use the model. So, we are not leaving them. Okay. So, let's say this is the case. The net emissions that have been emitted by the chimney is equal to sum total of all the uh, mass of the pollutant downwind. So, C is the concentration in environment. Cu will give me the mass of the pollutant per unit area per time. U is the wind velocity in x direction. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a cross section in the y, z plane. So Cu is the mass of the contaminant per area per unit time. And if I integrate this, and if I integrate this, because this is on uh, a cross section, dy and dz with appropriate limits to the integration, I will get the sum total of the pollutant that we are tracking downwind. This is exactly what we are going to do. So C we know from here, U is the velocity of the wind, dy, dz. Now let us look at what the limit of integration will be. We will also look at LHS in a bit, but right now let us focus on RHS, right hand side of the equation. We need to define the limit of integration. Let us look at Y. So let me clarify what y and z are. So uh, before we decide the limit of integration for y and z, let us understand what coordinates we are talking about, where the y, z and x are 0 and which direction they are. So x is the direction of the wind, where the velocity of the wind is constant, u. y is on the ground, so it is horizontal, it is on the horizontal plane and it is perpendicular to x and z is vertical. Now let's look at the limit of y. Now um, when we burn an incense stick or when you see the smoke coming out of a chimney or when we have a fire lit on the ground and we see the smoke moving, it seems like the smoke plume, the plume of the smoke seems to have a particular shape, particular figure because that is where it is obstructing the light, it has a color, we see it. However, what we know is that the smoke ranges from the center of the uh, plume, the center line of the plume all the way to minus infinity and plus infinity. Even though at minus infinity or at far away distance the concentration might be uh, undetectable or below detection, maybe the, uh, the molecule that is emitted here and is moving in the y direction or in the minus y direction will take very long time to reach far distances. But the model leaves room for the dispersion of the contaminant to happen Un, in an unobstructed ideal flat area for a very long, long distances, both in y direction, z direction, sky is not the limit and also in the x direction. There is no limit basically except the surface of the earth, there is no other limit. So y will go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So basically in y we are going from one end to the other of the universe. Now let us look at z. Now z also we should do minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, but here we have earth. Now we can assume earth to be an impermeable or nearly impermeable surface. 
And we can also assume that the contaminant, once it comes in contact with the earth, it is either bounced away or something miraculous happens, but it does not permeate through the earth, which may or may not be true. We know some contaminants will actually permeate the earth, some gaseous uh, contaminants, pollutants. The other assumption that we can make is that um, if it does come in contact with the earth, it does not adsorb on the earth. There are gaseous contaminants that we emit in, dust, in our industries which will get adsorbed to the soil. So if we assume those things are not happening, then we can take z from 0 to plus infinity because we are assuming that earth is impermeable, there is no adsorption happening. However, it is also possible to go from minus infinity to infinity which will result in a slight uh, error but it is still manageable error. For now, let us just write 0 to 0 to infinity. Um, regarding z, we have to also consider another very important factor which is what is the height of the chimney. So if the effective height of the chimney which is remember I want to make sure you understand this. The effective height of the chimney is equal to the actual height of the chimney or the actual height of the stack, height of the stack plus the plume rise. So now I am assuming by this point you already know this very well. So when I say height of the chimney, I am talking about the effective height of the chimney, not the physical height of the chimney. So in this when we are going to use capital H, we are talking about the effective height which includes plume rise. So a clarification that is very important. So if the chimney has an effective height of H, then the question is how do we, um, where do we put our coordinate axes? If the chimney has zero height, so the emission is happening on the ground, let us say there is no chimney, there is a pipe like, like let us say there is a stationary car that is emitting some gas, then carbon monoxide for example, then what is the, we want to find out how carbon monoxide is spreading in the area or the contaminant is spreading in the area or let us say there is a fire on the ground and you want to know how the smoke is moving, how the contaminants in the smoke are moving. In that case, the height, effective height would be 0 the, or the uh, nearly 0 because of heat some, it might have some plume rise. So let us take the first case. The first case is when uh, there is no chimney. This is the easier case, there is no chimney so H is going to be 0. So in that case, uh, our, our coordinate axes still remain on the ground centered at the chimney. So at the center here, uh, x equal to 0 is at the base of the chimney, z is equal to 0 at the base of chimney and y is equal to 0 at the base of the chimney. So in this case again, the integration will happen from 0 to infinity from, um, from the uh, surface of the earth all the way to the infinite height. So let us go ahead and integrate this. So let us put our, uh, so Q, the net uh, pollution that the, uh, the net contaminant or pollutant that we are tracking emitted is equal to double integral from 0 to infinity for z, from minus infinity to plus infinity for y. C, we will replace the equation that we have here. So we have k by x to the power Another thing you have to remember is when you are doing double integral, you are actually integrating over a volume. Single integral, you are integrating over an area, double integral, you are integrating over volume which is exactly what we want to happen here, what we want to do here. Oh yeah, I forgot, we have to multiply u. So let us write u here too. Okay, so we are integrating with respect to dy dz, so all the constants can come out. All the constants and the other terms that do not have y and z in them can come out. Okay, we are going to make some substitutions to make it easier for us to integrate. So let us say that A is equal to KU by 2X and let us say B is equal to 
u by 4 x. So, now we have q the sum total of emissions of the pollutant is equal to a double integral. Uh, I want to explain to you a change that I made from going from here to here. And the change that I made since this is a symmetric uh, system with respect to z, it is easier mathematically to integrate from minus infinity to infinity than from 0 to infinity. So, I also changed the limit of integration here. So, this is going from minus infinity to infinity and the z is also going from minus infinity to infinity. We are not, we are imagining there is no earth, right. So, the estimate that we will get by this integration by changing the limit of integration here will be twice as much as it needs to be. So, that is why I have divided it by 2 here and it also you will see how it makes integration much easier. Now, we need to make more substitutions. So, now we need to make more substitutions to integrate this very simply. Let us introduce a new variable y which is equal to root 2 d y by root d y and you might ask why root 2 because I know that this is going to be the best way to substitute it and you will see shortly why. Let us also introduce a new variable capital Z which is similarly equal to root 2 b d z z y and z are outside the square root remember that ok we are going to make these substitutions here which will make integration much easier. Now we have y square plus z square by 2. Let us keep this a curly bracket d capital Y dz. So, if you look here, we made these assumptions. So, we also need to find we made this substitution. So, we also need to know what dy is. dy would be root 2b by dy small dy. This is a small dy. And similarly, d capital Z would be equal to root 2 b dz small z dz. So, we made we need to make substitution for this also, we need to substitute small dy dz, and that is how we got this here. Okay, now this is a very simple integration, must be very familiar with you. So, let us go ahead and write down the integral. So, to integrate this, let me give you a hint, dear students, you need to convert this into polar coordinates. So, polar coordinates will look like this. We define r cos theta and r sin theta. So, that r cos theta uh, is equal to capital Y and r sin theta is capital Z. So, what will happen is this here you will get e to the power minus r square by 2. So, integration will become very easy. Of course, you need to define new dy dz. So, instead of this you will have uh, dr and d theta you will be integrating according to that. I am just going to write the integration solution, but the easiest way I know how to integrate this is by converting it into polar coordinates. Alrighty. So, once you integrate this uh, you are going to get a very simple solution. Okay. So, once you integrate this and you uh, put in your values what you will arrive is at c concentration is equal to q 2 pi x, x is the distance downwind under root dy dz. So, you know what we have done here e to the power minus y square by dy plus z square by dz u by 4 x. So, this is round bracket and this is square bracket and now what we are going to do is this is the final answer that we get after putting the boundary condition that we put that q is equal to this and then you integrate it by putting uh, by substituting for with polar coordinates and it is a very simple integration. Remember uh, we have to use very simple trigonometry sin square theta plus cos square theta is equal to 1 very easy and then you will arrive to this equation which is the which should be familiar to you from your basic statistics course. This resembles Gaussian distribution. Now, before I move ahead and make another substitution which will be more familiar to you from your uh, classes on Gaussian plume if you had any. 
uh, for those among us who had those classes is that what is special about a Gaussian distribution? Uh, if you remember in your basic statistics, we teach you that there is something called normal distribution. So normal distribution looks like a bell curve where most uh, the highest values or in this case the highest concentration of the contaminant will be along the center line and then it will reduce according to the dispersion coefficient sorry <laughs> according to the standard deviation and it reduces quite rapidly. So what we since we have arrived at a system that looks that resembles Gaussian distribution, what this is telling me is that, so let's say this is a chimney and it is releasing some contaminant that we want to track, we want to target. And then this is our x, y and z axes. So what it is telling me is that along the center line, al now in this particular situation, we have assumed that z, uh, the height of the chimney is zero. Along the center line, what this is telling me is that in y and z direction, in y and in z direction, we will have normal distribution of the contaminant. So basically in y direction, which is here, the concentration will be highest at the, so if I'm plotting the concentration on this axis, so concentration on this axis, and this is plus y, let's say, and this is minus y, y is the direction, then the concentration will be highest at the center line when y is equal to 0 and then it will drop rapidly. This is what Gaussian distribution is telling me and in z direction, so z direction will look like this because we are going vertical, so let's say this is z and in this I am plotting, let's use another color for this, so let's say in this I am using, I am plotting the concentration of the contaminant that I am tracking Then the highest concentration will be in the center line and then it will reduce rapidly. So clearly what that's the big reason why we use chimneys because we don't want the center line to be right at our home, at the level of our home. Now if the homes are on the ground level, using a chimney is beneficial to avoid that. But if we are living in skyscrapers, it may not be a very, uh, it may not be very suitable for us. But this is important to understand this Gaussian plume model where the word Gaussian is coming from tells me about the distribution of the contaminant along the center line. It also is, helps me understand that um, in situations, let's say in this case the air is not obstructing the flow of, um, of the contaminant, right? The contaminant is free to diffuse, it's free to disperse. But in cases when we have obstruction to the flow, let's say there is adsorption, there is retardation, then Gaussian distribution may or may not be what we see because then normal distribution is not what we will see. So this again, we, we assumed everything ideal, we assumed there is no obstruction to the flow and this worked perfectly for us. But in some situations, let's say you have a semi-permeable, semi-porous matrix and you have contaminant flowing through it via fluid and there is obstruction, there is retardation, then even though we can still apply the exact same diffusion and dispersion, sorry, diffusion and bulk action equations that we did at the beginning, we will have fixed law, we will have the bulk transportation, we can still assume our parallelopied, write similar equations, but we will have to also account for retardation, we will have to account for other obstruction and the end result may not be a Gaussian distribution. Okay, let us come back to this, let us finish this. I'm, I want, I need to make another substitution here to make it resemble the uh, the equation that many of you might be familiar with from your basic classes. Okay, so let us introduce a new variable, let us say sigma y square. Now remember I mentioned that this is a Gaussian distribution, it resembles Gaussian distribution and one thing about Gaussian distribution is that uh, there is, we can tell what percentage or what magnitude loss we will expect one standard deviation away from or two standard or n standard deviation away from the center line. So the standard deviation is very important and typically we use this symbol to um, sigma to represent that and so that is why I want to introduce sigma because here we are seeing Gaussian distribution so I want to introduce sigma to make it more, uh, to make it more clear that what we are seeing is a Gaussian distribution in both y and z direction. So sigma y square we introduce a new variable and it is basically 2 dy x by u. Now notice one thing, sigma y square is proportional to x, the distance from the downwind, in, in the downward direction from the chimney, y and dy, not y sorry, dy which is dispersion coefficient in y direction and inversely proportional to the wind velocity. So when you look up your sigma y values, typically we will give you graphs that we know from empirical data. 
Typically, what we have is x on the x-axis and sigma y values on the y-axis and you'll have curves and you'll just put your x and find out. Then the curves will be for different kinds of weather situation because all of this is or this dispersion coefficients are sensitive to the weather. So basically different weather situations are giving you an idea of the dispersion coefficient to expect and then you will find out for a given weather situation what is your sigma y. But please know that x is coming from here. Okay, we will similarly introduce a new uh, variable uh, sigma z square which similarly would be 2 z x by u sorry yeah 2 z x by u. Now we have introduced sigma z square sigma y square now we can substitute them in this uh, actually not here here and also yes here. So dy basically for example we will get dy is equal to sigma y square u by 2x and notice that we have u here, we have 4x here, so things are getting very easy for us, the substitution is going to be very easy. The net result we get is, we will get c, the concentration is equal to q by pi u sigma y sigma z, so we are replacing dy dz with sigma y sigma z e to the power minus 1 by 2 because we still have 1 by 2 left here, we have minus sign here y square by sigma y square plus z square by sigma z square and this my dear students is your Gaussian plume distribution model for air contaminants that are coming from a point source. Very important to remember all the assumptions we made at every single step. What I want to do in the next lecture is go through with you of what happens when certain assumptions are not met. For example, when we do not have wind because we assume that the wind is moving in x direction, what happens when there is no wind? If you look at this Gaussian plume model and Gaussian plume model, if your wind velocity is 0, then the concentration goes to infinity because the wind velocity is in denominator which does not make sense. So if in a perfectly still room you burn in incense, the concentration does not go to infinity if it, just because the wind velocity is 0. What happens is that this model is no longer relevant. So in the next class, I want to go through the scenarios where the assumptions of this model are challenged and to give you hints on how you can modify the derivation of this model or you can just make simple modifications in the existing model that we have, this model here, to make, this, um, to make your model more relevant to the situation. All right, students, this is all for today. See you in the next lecture. Thank you.